This is me, Vishnu. I'm, I lead the engineering team uh, at DeepSource. Uh, so great documentation could can help you run your team, uh, team run fast, uh, make users love your product, and uh, and drive revenue to your product. And so for, for the next panel, uh, I would like to invite Greg, uh, founder of Readme, to the front call. Hi, Greg. Hey, everyone. And, uh, and uh, Lynn, uh, co-founder of Layer CI. Hey, everyone. Uh, so uh, just to start off with, uh, so uh, what does documentation mean to you guys? Uh, maybe we could start with uh, Greg. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a lot of different types of doc documentation, of course. Um, we deal mostly with public documentation, um, specifically uh, lots of different types of technical documentation, but APIs are a big one. Um, and, uh, but that being said, internally, we deal with a lot of documentation. Um, I know Lynn definitely deals with a lot of internal documentation, both uh, probably at the company, but also as a product. Um, and um, one thing I'll say, and I think you know, we'll see if Lynn agrees or not. Um, for me, documentation doesn't necessarily mean um, paragraphs of text. And I think all too often when we think of documentation, we just think paragraphs of text and things written out. Whereas for me, um, I have a lot of different definitions of documentation. Um, anything that helps you understand how to use stuff, uh, to me, is considered documentation. Um, and I think of documentation a little bit differently. I don't think of it as like, um, you know, similar to a manual you'd get with IKEA furniture, for example. Um, I think, you know, for a lot of times with technical stuff, documentation is the UI or the UX uh, for for uh, for interacting with something, especially an API, where um, you know it's a black box and you can't actually like touch it or feel it or see it. Um, the only real way you have of communicating with an API is sort of via the documentation. So uh, those are some like little uh, bits and pieces I think about documentation. Um, Lynn, what about you? What do you think? Yeah, thanks for starting us off here, Greg. He's definitely the the expert on documentation uh, as, as they are a docs company, which is awesome. Um, but a lot of what you said really definitely resonates. Uh, and I definitely want to emphasize more on the user experience, both internally and externally. Uh, for us, uh, Ad documentation, honestly, is a way to communicate right, for different groups of people, um, especially when it's externally facing, right? Um, for developer products, especially like Layer CI, it's important on one side, uh, you know, if it's a new user that's coming in that doesn't know anything about Layer CI, they need to be able to find the things really quickly. Uh, and if it's, you know, an existing user that needs to learn more, they need to know, know something in an instant as well. And if they're an expert, that's another persona you have to care about. So I really think overall, it's definitely the user experience that matters a lot. And we don't talk about that enough. Yeah, I um, to build on that a little bit, I feel like, you know, many, many years ago, 30 years ago when programming kind of kicked off and technical stuff kicked off, um, and before that, uh, I learned how to program from a book. Um, you know, there's websites and stuff, but I used to have a ton of O'Reilly books. Um, and I think for a long time, documentation was like something that was printed physically. And there's a lot of rules when you print things physically. Um, you know, me, Lynn, and Vishen, we all see the exact same thing if we're looking at the same documentation, because it's a book and it has to apply to all three of us. Um, and it doesn't know what's going on with the person. And it's printed on paper and can't be changed. And it, it's not updated. It doesn't know anything about anyone. Um, it's structured in a way where uh, it's very linear. And um, you know things aren't repeated because it doesn't make a lot of sense on paper to keep repeating the same things over and over again. And where I'm going with this is I feel like, um, to a certain extent, as we've moved online and things have gotten much more digital, um, everything about everything has changed, except for documentation. We still tend to write it the same way we write it for a book. Like, any documentation still has like a table of contents on the left side, which is like chapters. Um, and, you know, we still write it very linearly and stuff like that. And I think, um, you know, uh, Lynn, you and I, and even Deep Source, uh, none of us really come close to competing as far as products go. But I do think we all are very similar in the sense that we're all trying to find new and interesting ways to help give people insight into technical things um, and kind of to a certain extent rethink what the word documentation actually means. Absolutely. And I have to challenge you on this one, Greg. Oh, no. I really th I think there's definitely um, still many different versions of the same book that are put out there. And uh, I can't imagine writing documentation like that. But even with it being online, I think people hate it just as much at actually doing the work of maintaining things and updating things. I think that really is the most difficult part about documentation that 
is the user experience also for the person maintaining something, right? Uh, it, it's not fun to write documentation. It's not fun to update things. And oftentimes uh, that's where documentation becomes flawed as, as a concept. Uh, but I definitely think there's strategies to, to actually improve that. And I think part of that also starts with on the technical side, uh, code and go, good processes overall internally. So, so in terms of, so uh, uh, you've been say, uh, talking about, uh, so when you're a startup, when you're a startup and you, you're basically uh, uh, three people in a room writing code, you don't really start writing a lot of documentation. You, you don't have the time to, you probably write a few comments. If uh, somebody in the future is lucky, somebody writes comments. So how do I, as a team, so when I grow my team, when, when, uh, when the three engineers become 10 engineers and when 10 engineers become 20 engineers, how do I now, uh, when should I start worrying about documentation? When should I start worrying about, should I document? I'm talking about primarily from an internal documentation perspective. So when do I start worrying about documentation? Do I document enough? And what? how do I get started with it? So uh, if, uh, uh, Lynn, if you could probably sure, throw some light on good. that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with internal documentation, you'd be lucky if you're, you know, the first three engineers at the company where you can dictate a lot of the documentation best practices. Um, and the ethos at Layer CI actually is within Layer CI, as little documentation as possible is is good documentation. So everything starts with good code. Everything starts with you know putting the right tooling in place. Um, and you know there's multiple ways of writing a single line of code, right? So if you're able to, for example, have a variable be part of the documentation, um, it may seem complex or you know a little bit more. Um, you know, involved at first having to do that. But uh, we really think that uh, optimizing for writing things quickly is not the way to go, but instead optimizing for less documentation in the future and optimizing for less work for the person who's going to review this code base in the future is actually the best way to go in the very beginning. So that's, that's my piece on that. What about you, Greg? Yeah, I um, have a very similar uh, opinion to you, which is, um, or I don't have words in your mouth, but uh, I think uh, when you're early on a project, um, you're not really making uh, decisions that you stand by two, three, four years down the line. If you're only two or three people, there's a you know you haven't probably haven't hit product market fit. You probably don't know exactly what you're building. Um, and it's it's not the best use of time to do things like uh, and bear with me, but um, to like be like writing tons of tests or to um, be writing documentation or there's a lot of like engineering practices that we do now that um, you know when you're three, four, ten people even you're it's still very early and you know even if you know we get to a hundred engineers, two hundred engineers, that's nothing compared to like look at a company like Google or Oracle or something like that where there's thousands and thousands. Um, and what I'm getting at there is. Um, I think to a certain extent, you have to just embrace the fact that, um, you know, nef nothing's ever gonna be perfect. Nothing's ever gonna be perfectly documented. Everything's a little messy. Um, and uh, uh, it's, um, I don't think that, I have one um, exception to that, which is I think getting started guides uh, internally and externally are incredibly important. Um, Agreed. I think that uh, there's nothing worse than whether it be joining a new job uh, and spending the first two days of your job, like trying to get you know Mongo or SQL set up uh, or connected and you can't figure it out and you're like begging people that, like that's really annoying. Um, but even then, if you have three engineers, like you know, the, you just sit down with someone and help out uh, when you get your fourth engineer. Um, it's not the end of the world, but um, I think getting started guides are the one thing that I think, you know, desperately need a lot of work. Um, my opinions are very different, by the way, for, and maybe this is just because this is uh, what my company does, but external API documentation, because um, with external API documentation, that's it. You can't like look at the source code. You can't like trace it through and try to figure out what's going on. Like for like, if you're trying to use like Twilio's API, Either you're going around guessing parameters or you look at the docs. There's no way to like examine the code. Um, but for internal stuff, you know, like Lynn said, you can look at it, you can get the feel for it. Like most languages have conventions that you're supposed to vaguely follow or could follow or whatever. Um, so yeah, I um, you know, I would love it if everyone did perfect documentation, but also I don't even know if I do believe that because no one wants to read documentation either. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, I would I would this is I know this is kind of going against the um, the spirit of the, the conversation, but um, 
I would much prefer working at a company where there was this like ethos of like, people are there to help and excited to help. And like, you know, your coworkers and are, you feel very comfortable reaching out and like, you're not annoying them. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, you're always eager to help a new employee. Um, I think that sometimes early on goes a lot further than documentation. Cause in a, in a lot of ways, like just go read the documentation is such a like um, glib way to like, you know, push people off to a certain extent. For sure. And Indeed. Greg, I would, oh, go ahead. Um, go on. Yeah, I was going to uh, point out when Greg said, oh, don't waste your time on documentation or tests in the beginning. I 100% agree. And sometimes we actually discourage people who are very, very early on in the journey um, to not build tests for or documentation for features that may not exist in a year. Right. Um, it definitely doesn't make sense to do that with your time. You've got so much more stuff to do. Uh, and that includes things like supporting new engineers as they get onboarded. And um, our suggestion would be to have a very up-to-date readme file or something like that, or you know, I have a Google Doc that tells you exactly what to do in terms of setting up the, the tech stack and for your first day of work, what you should be doing. Um, I think that because it's up-to-date, there's someone who can assist you in understanding everything. Um, that's a very good experience for, for a new engineer, for example. Uh, so coming back to what Lynn said, right? Uh, so uh, even maintaining readme's, right? So how do you maintain uh, these things? So I, I'm pushing some code, and I've made, I've built a new feature. How do you uh, tell your engineers? Because engineers, I, I'm pretty sure most engineers don't like to write documentation, uh, or at least I don't enjoy it. So in that case, how do you make engineers write documentation if you know if it's something that would help other people? Is there any other any thoughts on this? Greg, did you want to take this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to, um, and this is again just my opinion, and you know, Lynn, I think we have similar opinions on this, which is, if you don't like writing and don't like reading it, like you know, forcing everyone to do something they don't like never never works. You don't get anything good out of that. Um, <laughs> there are people who do love writing documentation. Uh, there's definitely a subset of engineers who really love it, and then there is a you know entire profession, technical writers that that obviously really like it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it for a living. Um, but um, you know, a lot of times I think you know uh, that you can get into this like point where there's just too much documentation, people are just writing too much, and then, you know, you can't find it anyway. Um, you know, I, I've always kind of found, and I don't know, Lynn, if you agree with this, that like, you know, searching on Slack tends to be better than, or looking at GitHub issues, or just looking at code commits, like, that tends to be, um, you know, we're really lucky where we have this, like, we have tons of different tools, and there's no one tool that's gonna fix this, um, but like, GitHub commit, or sorry, like, uh, Git commits, or whatever you use, but like, Git commits, or, you know, insanely valuable and like get blame is one of the most insanely valuable things. You can kind of like, you know, be a little bit of a detective and stuff. And like, let's say you didn't do that. Let's say you told every single engineer they had to document every change they made. Um, you just have paragraphs, you had pages and pages and pages of text, which is kind of useless. Um, so I, I've always kind of been a bigger fan of rather than like forcing people to write documentation where they want to. And again, I say the one exception is getting started guides and like, um, you know, making sure that people can get, get started. Um, you know, I don't think there's really, because things change so frequently and so often um, that I think it's better to kind of let people rely on, uh, you know, being detectives to a certain extent. Um, not, you don't want them to like have to like, you know, look around for stuff, make it too hard. But, um, you know, there's so many like um, fragments and like just like breadcrumbs that are kind of just left in the engineering process now because we're really lucky to have a ton of tools. Um, like pull requests, like if you want to know something's done, you look at a git blame. That brings you back to a request or to a, a git commit. Then you look at like the pull request that's associated with it. You see all the comments and like that right there is the documentation to a certain extent. Um, and I can't really imagine anyone sitting down and writing a better um, you know documentation than than like their real time what's actually going on, being able to like you know rewind and see see what people are thinking. Lynn, do you agree, disagree? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I generally agree with that as well. Um, you know, if you don't like reading it, if you don't like writing it, who is to say that everybody else wouldn't? So minimizing documentation overall uh, and also making things like docs searchable, especially for uh, actually on the, uh, on the external documentation side, making docs searchable was a super important part of what we do. Um, and I wish we discovered things like README, uh, Greg's company, uh, during those early days because making really good UI for, for docs is really difficult. Uh, even for experienced engineers. Um, yeah, quick start guides, super, super important. Um, and 
there must be better ways in terms of best practices. Maybe Greg, you can touch more on uh, sort of ex external facing documentation. What are some no-nos and what are some uh, best practices there for quick start guides? Yeah, so we have a new feature, uh, which you didn't know about, so you weren't setting them up for this, but uh, called recipes, because um, I always feel like, um, you know, people, when they think of, like, if you were to, like, you know, think of your favorite API, let's say, like, it's, like, probably Twilio or Stripe, because that's everyone's favorite, um, and, you know, you close your eyes and you think about it, um, you're probably imagining their reference guides. Um, and you, first of all, you're not even thinking about the API, you're thinking about the documentation. And secondly, you're thinking about their reference guides. And um, I have this like belief that reference guides are both the most and least important part of documentation. Um, reference guides are the ones that would like enumerate every little detail, um, like you know every parameter and the values possible for things like that. And um, I think that they're incredibly important because they're really the only interaction you have with an API. Uh, and if they have to be completely correct, you know, you can't look at the code, you have to like trust them. But they're also very, they should be the least important part of your docs in a certain way because um, nobody wants to like, you know, jump around your docs and reassemble API calls or, you know, anything like that. Like I think most people, back to your question, Lynn, they want to just use it. And that sounds really, really simple, but, um, you know, I see so many documentation so many times they have like a thousand endpoints on the sidebar, but you're like, what does your API just do? Like there's most APIs have like three or four things that are kind of like, um, you know, the first thing you'd want to do, like, let's talk about like Twitter's API. I'm, I'm not familiar with it, but I imagine, you know, posting tweets and reading tweets are the two like major things that people really want to do with it. Um, right. And then you can get to like maybe ads and stuff like that, but it's like, people just want to do a few very, you know, obvious things and, and don't make them write the code, don't make them figure it out, don't make them understand how you've like framed your API or anything like that. Like I'm a huge fan of giving people code snippets in their language, um, letting them copy and paste it. And um, we have like a code builder uh, feature where you can like, you know, let the people type in their, well, they get their API keys already, but like they can type stuff in and, and all that. And like, I don't know, I, I think um, a lot of times documentation is just very lazy uh, when really what you just need is like one or two really great code snippets. Um, and you also need the documentation, um, of course, but uh, you know, you can't just stop there. You have to like be really good at these getting started guides. Um, you know, we have this concept of um, the time to like minimum viable call. Like how do you get people from zero to like making something noteworthy happen with the API as quickly as possible? And um, some APIs make that incredibly, incredibly hard um, to do. Um, and you know, not just APIs, but any sort of technical, uh, technical thing, um, but yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's almost like a pitch too, right? Um, something that was really important early on was actually perfecting the external docs a little bit more than the internal docs. Um, mm -hmm. Because we just assumed nobody knew what we were talking about, especially if we're, if we're making this new version of YAML, this new version of everything, combining things together, you really needed to have a succinct way of getting people in excited while educating them at the same time uh, without mm -hmm. having them to do so much work. So, so actually having code snippets that can be live in, you know, a second or two would be, would be really awesome. That's, that's the, the perfect experience in our opinion, if we could continue doing that for multiple different frameworks. Uh, so Greg, uh, so one, one question I had, so uh, with API documentation, right? Uh, how, how much does automation solve uh, docu uh, the documentation problem for API? Say you have, a huge number of APIs. You're building a API first company. What role does automation play in that? So you have things like Swagger and uh, all sorts of uh, API frameworks that we use. Uh, what role does it play and how important is it to automate that or bring that part of the CI process? Yes. So I think there's um, two ways that I'd frame automation in this situation. The first is um, the automation on the side of the person creating the OAS file, and then there's um, you know automation on our side. I think developers are very excited about automation um, always, and there's good and there's bad things about automation. The nice thing about automation is you can kind of like set up rules and make sure it's consistent, make sure it's updated, things like that. That's great about automation. Um, but I think way too many people think that a Swagger file is enough to get started with uh, an API. Um, so for people who don't know, a Swagger, or now they're called OAS files, are a gigantic JSON or YAML file that describes everything about your API. And if you look around, so if you're ignoring like the, the really good APIs, like Stripe and Twilio and Notion, all those that put effort into it, um, if you drop down like a level, um, most people just think that's enough. And they just throw what I said before, like reference guides. and 
that is one of the worst experiences ever because it's basically like you have like a mini like online escape room where you're expecting people to like run around your docs and like you know be like okay this parameter probably is sent here where did I get my API key oh that's someplace else and like um, this goes back to what I said before like Swagger um, and OAS files they get turned into reference guides and my mindset on this is reference guides tend to be very similar to like um, you know they're called reference guides and they're kind of like reference material like a thesaurus or a dictionary and like you never hand someone a, a thesaurus or a dictionary and say like, oh, okay, go learn this language. Um, it's great for looking up, it's great for checking in on stuff, but you lose, you don't get the like, the, you know, to keep this metaphor going, uh, maybe a little too far, like you don't get the grammar, you don't get like the colloquial stuff, you don't understand how to use it. It's great if you just need to look something up. Um, but I think all too often people just throw out reference guides or, you know, the automated stuff and say like, good, we're done. Um, and I think that's, you know, and then then you're like, no one wants to use our API or no one's using it or why are people like, you know, such idiots, they can't figure it out. When you haven't like helped them, you haven't done, back to what Lynn said before, like these getting started guides, um, topical guides, um, having support forms where people can ask questions. Um, there's so much more than just the reference guides. Um, you should see the reference guides as literally that references if people, you know, get stuck and really need to figure something out. Um, but I think, you know, one of the worst things you can do is just automate your docs completely and, and not think about it. So. I'll sum this up quickly by saying like, we have kind of two levels of uploading docs. The first is semi-automated. It's the, the Swagger OAS files that you upload and like we build it all out. And then we build on top of it, we automate uh, code sample generation and uh, SDKs and a bunch of cool stuff like that. Um, but it wouldn't be very good if you stopped there. Like you also, everyone who uses us also needs to write out guides and they need to write like specific tutorials um, and how to do it and stuff like that because there's nothing you can get from a Swagger file or an OAS file that says like, this is the most important endpoint and this is where you should start or like, this is not important or like, this is why you should care about this or these two work really well together, stuff like that. Interesting. Uh, so, uh, so one, uh, I would like to take a different uh, tangent now. So uh, to talk about uh, non-technical documentation in general. So what do you think of, uh, you know, your design uh, resources or design language, documenting things outside your so your code or your API documentation. So what are your thoughts on that? Lynn, do you have any answers? We were just talking sure, about design I, before this, actually. I, yeah, yeah. I think I could speak more on maybe like business and operation uh, mm -hmm. documentation, things like that. Um, I think whenever I'm the only one or whenever someone is the only one, I guess, getting into new territory, especially as founders, you're always learning things every single day. Uh, and you know that at some point you're going to have to replace yourself and have someone else be working that, that particular uh, part of the process. So as much as you can, you know, in very succinct language a clear language if you're able to you know put it in a google doc or put it in the meeting minutes where it's very referenceable uh, and people can find it immediately no matter if it's day one at the company or day 100 i think that's pretty important so letting people know how, how to get there no matter what tech stack you use whether it's notion you know whether it's google things like that um, slack as well has been really helpful for being referenceable but i think the combination of those as long as you don't have too too many tools spread across uh it is a, is a good way of managing non-technical documentation greg what do you think i think design is is your bread and butter so okay i'll go i'll go that way um and the other <laughs> one you said like i've been kind of anti-documentation which is weird because i have a documentation company um and i'm not i'm not against it because i do think that um there's it's almost impossible to be a good uh i don't know what the word like maybe leader or something like that if you aren't good at writing um i think um you know being able to clearly communicate what you're thinking is is a hallmark of anyone whether it's like a ceo or just someone leading a, a small project um but uh yeah for design i mean again there's been so much really nice stuff that's come out in the past like five years or so where i think it kind of replaces a lot of the needs for documentation and what i mean by that is um you know, you're having these like storybook or like component libraries. Um, Figma has so many, like you can look at the history, you can like see comments that have been resolved. Like, you know, we're getting to this point where um, the, the, the best products in their spaces tend to be, I don't say self-documenting because you still need to like write things down. Um, so for example, back to like, you know, GitHub, you still need to write down and have the discussions in GitHub, for example, in a pull request about why something's gonna happen or not, but you don't have to like, put that in Notion and make sure it's all in one place necessarily, I think. Um, 
you know, you just need to be consistent about where people can try to find stuff. And, you know, back to design, um, you know, there's component libraries, there's a ton of tooling around all that. And like, I don't say it's self-documenting because it's definitely not, but there's a place for all of it, which is really nice. And you can kind of go back in history and see like why decisions were made and things like that. And, um, you know, things only can continue to be true. And um, I, I'm really excited about kind of like, um, not self-documenting in a lazy, like it'll figure itself out kind of way, but self-documenting in a like, oh, all the like documentation is actually like in line with the design. Um, you can't have comments in Photoshop at all. You can't have comments in, you know, Vim from 20 years ago, but you do have comments in GitHub, you have comments in Figma and um, it's still a lot of writing. It's just not, you know, um, you know, all over the map where, where, or sorry, it is all over, but it's not, it doesn't have to be in one central location and thought of the same way we think of documentation traditionally, I think. Right. And I think uh, to jump on that, a really good analogy is actually why has an email phased out, right? Why has email not phased out as a product, right? As, as a concept, right? Generally, it's it's just because it's very res referenceable. It's very easy to pick mm -hmm. up uh, and it's very searchable. And um, yeah, I agree. Like tools that enable you almost to document naturally, right? Instead mm -hmm. of like a separate task that you have to do afterwards, I think mm -hmm. are really good products. Um, and one thing that inspired us when we were actually making Layer CI as a developer tool was, you know, uh, as many people are, we're big fans of Docker. And one of the most beautiful things about Docker is their Docker file syntax, being very expressive and being able to, you know, take this code and show it to someone else and they'll immediately understand what's going on is the similar philosophies will apply to, to Layer CI. Instead of YAML, it's, it's very similar to Docker file syntax. So in the same way, I think products like Figma are really great for design because they keep that user experience in mind, not just for the designer, but for anyone that's collaborating, especially developers. So uh, I think we have a question from the audience. Uh, uh, will it help if documentations are videos or voice notes? Uh, do, do, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, uh, my belief is that people learn different ways. Oh, sorry, Lynn, go for it. I don't know, go, go for it. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think people learn in many different ways. Um, I think some people prefer text, some people like video. Um, my overall answer is the more places you can get stuff, um, you know, it, every little, like put it in video, put it in text form, put it everywhere. Um, sure. Uh, you know, people seem to really, especially people earlier in the career seem to really like YouTube videos about programming because you actually watch it and there's no like ambiguity. There's no like, you know, when you're translating stuff into English or like paragraphs of text from like how you're actually doing, you always miss stuff. When you can just watch someone like type it out, you're like, oh, okay, I didn't, you know, they forgot that. So um, I think it's great if you want to do videos, um, but I don't think there's like one definitive way to do it. I think just do as many things as you possibly can. Yeah, I agree that if you have the resources to document the way people learn, like I saw some really great documentation the other day where uh, you can pick a path so you can say, okay, I'm a, I'm a visual learner, or I, I like to read mm -hmm. things, or I like to watch YouTube videos. I think having those choices are really great, um, especially because I realized from from our point of view of uh, having a lot of back-end engineers that use this, they really just like reading, uh, and they don't like mm -hmm. the videos as much. So, so actually being able to cater to different user groups is pretty important. Uh, on the side of video recorded notes, I think internally, we've been trying to do as little meetings as possible. Um, and any sort of asynchronous uh, communication adoption using things like Loom or Vidyard is actually really awesome. Um, but also keeping in mind, uh, will it be accessible to others? Uh, and which sort of team uh, likes this sort of format and how do you kind of implement that as a standard versus one person sends a voice note, the other person sends a Loom, and then the next person sends a Slack message. So as long as it's a, a little bit more uniform in the way you you decided to approach things and everybody's on the same page. I think that's good. That, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Uh, then uh, I have another question. Uh, in terms of uh, to bringing the, quest, the, the topic over to open source, uh, how do you think open source? <laughs> it's, it's, it like raining? it's raining and lightning. In New York? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Wow. I thought I was under attack. It's <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, so back to the question. So uh, about open source, uh, 
what what differences are there between say documenting for an open source project if you're a maintainer if you're uh, part of an open source community or maintaining a big project like say docker or uh, something uh, like that right so a main, main project so where does documentation come into that and how important is it so then do you have any thoughts on that yeah happy to um I mean, one thing that was really important to us from the beginning was thinking about the open source community, um, making our docs editable by the open source community or by anybody who's using us. Uh, I think that's generally a good practice because there are a lot of uh, thoughts that even the creators of something may not have thought of, especially when new use cases pop up. So making it as accessible as possible is pretty important. Um, and I think um, Greg also mentioned at some point uh, previous to this discussion that um, the concept of forums is a great replacement for just reference guides and things like that. Maybe Greg, if you wanted to talk about that, that was good. Yeah. I'm not, again, for the record, clear. I'm not anti-documentation. I'm anti this concept that <laughs> documentation is paragraphs of text in a row. Um, and, you know, I think support forums are such an amazing place for, you know, unstructured content because I'm um, someone in the chat asks, and I don't think we'll have time to get to it, but like what kind of documentation makes a reader hooked to the end? Um, I don't think you necessarily need to think of documentation as like very linear that way, but rather like, you know, maybe it's a comment someplace, maybe it's a support form, maybe it's a good error message. Like documentation is less about, I think it's a very lazy way to look at it as like, you know, okay, pop open my editor and start typing. And it's more like just a question of usability and like sometimes paragraph text is the best way, sometimes it's not. Um, but search lets you not have to decide that signal versus noise. You can just like hide everything away in a support form and then it can still answer people's questions when they need it, but not make them read through a bunch of noise trying to figure out, you know, the answer to their question. Yeah. And to add on that a little bit, on the technical side, something that's been helpful internal for internal documentation is actually within commit logs, we have a rule of no three-letter acronyms or uh, anything that uh, people who aren't technical can't understand. So actually saying this is for this customer because of this this issue or this, this feature that they were looking for. So same thing with, uh, you know, being on a sales team or being on marketing. There's so many three letter acronyms, I hate them. But, uh, you know, being able to define them and being able to make it as easy as possible for everyone to be on the same page, um, even in English, seems to be quite difficult. So having that sort of practice for commit logs is actually something I haven't seen a lot of companies do. So I think that could make it interesting for the team. And uh, when you put it on Slack, everyone knows what's going on. Yes. Uh, so w one thing I've noticed uh, in most of the open source uh, communities that is something that I really enjoy reading in a lot of these projects is the contributor doc about how you contribute to these uh, uh, the repos. So some of them are very, uh, you're basically bringing in a diverse set of people who have different styles of writing things and uh, doing things. So uh, I think contributor docs is, a, I think, something that I enjoy reading or uh, that kind of brings the community together around projects. Uh, yeah. Uh, so awesome. there was one other question. Uh, so there is another uh, audience question. How do you budget the right amount of time to spend on documentation? Right, I, I, don't, I don't think of it that way. Um, I think of it more as, um, you know, I. Engineers are very autonomous. Uh, they tend to be. Uh, they tend to be very, um, you know, I, I've never sat around and told an engineer how to spend their time, um, but rather, and as an engineer, I've never been told to, how to spend my time. Um, I think it's just a general expectation that, you know, it's your job to, um, you know, make sure that you're responsible for all the stuff around your main code. So documentation could be one of those things, things like that. But um, I just don't think there's an answer. Uh, I think that, um, Maybe there is, and I don't know, like maybe Lynn, you have an answer, but like, I, I just think it's the same thing. Like how would you budget, how much time do you spend on tests or how much time do you spend on um, training other people and stuff like that? Like I've always found the best way is engineers when given the autonomy and like the trust tend to be very good at, um, hopefully if they're a good engineer, very good at understanding how they can use their 40 hours a week or whatever um, to best you know help the project and the people around them. And I've, I've never really thought about that as a question. Um, External documentation is a little bit different. Um, you know, that's more of like a how many, what's the head count, and you know, how much do you want to invest in that? And I think that's a different question. But um, internally, I've never thought about that. It's like how much time do you to dedicate to Slack, or how much time do you dedicate to like PRs? Um, 
I've never really had a conversation with anyone. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think each person is different and it depends on their routine. You know, um, I think sometimes it's obvious that more documentation is needed, especially if mm -hmm. you're getting the same support questions, right? There's the obvious, if it's being asked the second, the 10th time, then it probably should go into some form yeah. of documentation, whether it's FAQ or the reference guide, or you need to make a video mm -hmm. on it. So there are some natural signs of progression that, oh, I should probably write this down, or I should probably get someone to write this down. Um, or, as you mentioned, there's- Or fix oh, it. Um, or fix, or it. fix or it, rather it. than just document it. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, though. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. That was the end of my thought on that one. Uh, I think uh, you said it pretty succinctly. So, but yeah, I mean, it's it's back to like to to build on that though. Like, I think if you say like you know, it's kind of like defining what the you know the hammer and a nail thing. If you know, if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Like, if you're like you have to spend two days a week on documentation, you spend time on documentation. But like a lot of times, just fix it or do something else or like there's a more fundamental thing than documentation necessary. So like, I would always hate to like say like this is how you fix the problem. Um, I think documentation is just a tool in a developer's belt tool tool belt. For sure. And same thing with tests and, and with documenting on those is like, even if it's your job, like if you do, if you say, okay, let me budget two hours on this every week, it's probably not going to end well because you'll probably make more work than you need to for yourself. Uh, and so I, I definitely think a uh, number of hours is not really a great way to track that. Either. Mm -hmm. uh, other questions from the question from the audience, uh, how do you make your documentation accessible so that it isn't overwhelming for beginners and should be asked if there's a lookup possible for veterans. Basically, how do you make it accessible? Right. Um, yeah, I guess uh, I could start something that Greg has already said, and I think it, the, the same rings true for this is quick start guides are, are good for everyone, right? Using simple language not using a lot of acronyms. And if you're gonna use something uh, the first time as an acronym, please define it in some way, um, making it searchable uh, for, for the veterans. So beyond the quick start guide, they could just look for advanced workflows, for example, is something that we have. Um, or you know, if you have integrations, particular documentation for integrations should be a potentially another tab. But like, like Greg said, you know, with table of contents, I think you really have to be very, very selective uh, because it is not a dictionary. It's not a book, you know, with 100 chapters. It's best to keep it as clean as possible so that people don't feel overwhelmed, um, whether they're expert or, or new to it. So I don't know if, Greta, if you have anything else to add on that one. Yeah, I agree mostly. Uh, and I would end it by saying, um, the difference between a beginner and someone more experienced is someone more experienced might be able to be a little bit better at figuring things out, you know, given enough time or whatever. But at the end of the day, no matter if they're beginners or incredibly experienced, they don't care about your technical product. They don't, don't want to spend time on it. They want to be as easy to think. Um, they'll like the results and they'll be really excited about the results, but like no one, no matter how much of a veteran they are, wants to spend, you know, days trying to figure something out. Um, the difference is that a veteran might be able to, whereas a beginner can't. Um, but I think if you optimize for, you know, really getting simple, getting started, like a veteran might not need it, but they're going to like it even more. Like they're not, you know, they're going to, they're going to love it and they're not going to, you know, they're not going to be upset that it was more complicated or anything like that. So I think, um, I think it's kind of a weird, uh, I wouldn't ever think like, ah, it's, there's a difference between the two people. I think it's more of a, um, you know, no one wants to spend a lot of time on your API or your code library or anything like that anyway. They just want to build something really cool and or get their job done or go home to their family or whatever happens to be. Right. Um, so, uh, so yeah. Yeah, and and I guess also something that sparked from, from you mentioning that is, you know, even if you're an expert, if you're trying to teach someone something new, uh, what better way than to give them something easy to take a look at, right? So I think it's much more collaborative when you make it accessible. So maybe a rule of thumb to think about, is this going to be good documentation? Is is someone who's an expert at this going to be able to show it to the next person? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I think we are running out of time. Uh, uh, Greg, uh, do you want to summarize and uh, uh, have a few last words about uh, documentation in general? 
Uh, not really, other than I think that, um, you know, my company, even you go to our homepage, we say we do documentation and all that, but um, I think that's, you know, very prescriptive as a solution. I think the real answer is usability for developer tools has such a gigantically long way to go. Um, documentation props it up a lot, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of different ways to, to make your API code library, whatever else incredibly easy to use. Um, it might be documentation, it might be more interactive stuff. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I don't like using the word documentation as, as much as I like, you know, the concept of like usability and is really being really thoughtful about that. Lynn, uh, what Lynn? are your thoughts? Yeah, I definitely agree with Greg. And I guess the thing I've been trying to hit home is as little documentation as possible, if you could avoid it. Start with good code, start with good practices, start with good people, and uh, the rest will follow. And definitely um, consider consider asking yourself questions on user experience more often. I think that's the thing that we should continue talking about when it comes to the word documentation. That's not just about writing, but rather um, writing for, for usability. All right, guys. Uh Thanks a lot uh, for having uh, for joining us for the discussion for the panel. Uh, I think it, it, was, it, was, it was a very uh, uh, insightful uh, uh, conversation. And I'm I'm really glad that you guys were here. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Vishnu. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Vishnu. Thanks.